Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, these are my disclosures. And I'm also <coughs> Irish, and I like alcohol. <laughs> and then, um, so we're going to talk about vitamin D, and this is a very important element in my opinion. You can see here that it basically doesn't just affect bone, it affects calcium and phosphorus, uh, hemostasis, growth regulation, immunomodulatory effects, and cardiovascular effects, and neurovascular effects. I think my mic just went on. We do know that a single initial MED, MEB, or minimal epidermal dose, of ultraviolet radiation to a light-skinned individual will release approximately 20,000 international units of vitamin D3 into the circulation within 24 hours. If you're African-American or a dark-skinned individual, it may take up to 10 times as long to release the same dose. So as you see where we developed, we all, seemed, we all came out of Africa or somewhere around Africa where we were exposed to vitamin D all year. And then migrations occurred, so we went north and we went south, and then we went further north and further south, such that there are some people who live in an area where they get less than six months sunshine per year and are typically chronically deficient in vitamin D. That's the group, incidentally, who has a very high rate of prostate cancer, themselves and African Americans. If you go back and you look at the studies in the primates and how the humans evolved, the early old world primates had levels of vitamin D of about 120 plus. Humans exposing full skin surface to the sunshine, like a Matabili tribesman today, still has the same levels of vitamin D. But if you look at a Bantu tribesman who lives in the same area and wears Western clothes, his levels are about 40 or 50. If you look at somebody who comes from 43 degrees north latitude, their normal level is down below 40, and then if they start supplementing, but they're still working outside, they can gradually get it coming back up. But now, northern people are typically taking 4,000 international units per day, or they should be, and their levels are again around 100. So the Food and Nutritional Board in the States initially recommended a dose of 600 international units per day. That was for bone health. But for all other indicators, and I've just shown you some of the other areas that vitamin D is important, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer, the evidence wasn't deemed to be convincing. So currently, they've increased the dose to 4,000 international units, and fortunately for us, that was the level that we've been using for the last number of years at MUSC to investigate these effects of vitamin D. The big issue that people are concerned about is toxicity. And will I get hardening of the arteries? Will I turn out to be calcified? Well, you only start to see problems when you're on 100,000 international units per day or more. So 4,000 international units is not a risk. Now, in terms of the anti-cancer mechanisms, there's increased expression of IGF-BP3, which causes cell cycle arrest. It's a promoter of TGF-B2, which results in apoptosis and growth arrest. It also has effects on COX-2, which is responsible for inflammation. It inhibits NF-kappa-beta, and I will tell you more about that in a minute. It has anti-proliferative effects on cell lines and also preventing D-differentiation. And we know from epidemiologic and in vitro studies, they suggest that it has a role as a chemopreventative agent. So epidemiologic studies show an increased prostate cancer incidence in African Americans and those who live in northern latitudes, I told you that. Human prostate cells express transcription factors required for the activity and metabolism of vitamin D. In vitro and in vivo studies have shown inhibition of proliferation and invasiveness of prostate cancer cells by vitamin D. And we asked the question, could vitamin D supplementation while on active surveillance for prostate cancer decrease progression of disease? There was a very interesting article by Grant et al. in the Clinical Cancer Research in 2014, which dealt with the mechanisms of action and the effect of those mechanisms in terms of anti-cancer effect. And you can see it has effects in cell cycle arrest, modulation of growth factors, inhibition of angiogenesis, and inhibition of invasion metastasis. So our first study, which was basically just an investigatory analysis, assessed the safety and efficacy of vitamin D3 at 4,000 units per day on patients undergoing active surveillance. There were 48 subjects in the, in the study, and we monitored their vitamin D levels throughout. There were repeat biopsies performed at one year according to normal clinical practice, and we looked at PA and PSA and biopsy results to see if there was a clinical effect. 
We broke the patients into three groups, those with less than 20 units, or less than 20 nanograms per nil, between 20 and 40, and those above. And they were compared to 20 age match controls obtained from the institutional database that we have of 700 patients of, with prostate cancer. First thing we found that, as expected, if you look at the left side of this graph, the African Americans were dramatically below Caucasian Americans in their vitamin D level. The good news was it took two months of supplementation before they came back up to a normal level, the same as the Caucasians. There were no significant differences in PSA levels or trajectory comparing the supplemental arm versus the control arm. But 61% of the supplemental arm had a decreased number of positive cores on repeat biopsy at one year, compared to 20% of the controls. 37% of the study patients progressed, compared with 70% of the match controls. And vitamin D was well tolerated with no evidence of toxicity. And the most deficient vitamin D group had higher initial PSA values, higher increases in PSA, and more progressions in Gleason score on follow-up biopsy. This shows you the differing trajectories that were seen. On the left are the patients who were supplemented. On the right are the patients who were not. We also saw significant differences in the reduction of progression of prostate cancer in subjects supplemented and observed that the most vitamin D deficient groups had initially higher PSA levels, higher increases in PSA, and more yeah. progression and Gleason score on follow-up biopsy. So at the present time, we know prostate cancer disproportionately affects the two groups I mentioned. We know there are racial disparities in prostate cancer outcome, which mirror racial differences in serum levels of vitamin D. We know that sustained supplementation will eliminate the racial disparities in serum levels of vitamin D between African Americans and, ca and Caucasians. And this regime resulted in a decreased number of positive cores of repeat biopsy. So we have two more studies that we're doing. One is a randomized trial, which is currently ongoing. These are for patients on active surveillance. They're being supplemented, as I mentioned. There's 100 patients in each arm, and we're 75% accrued to this level. Then we did a neoadjuvant study where we looked at patients prior to prostatectomy. We supplemented them for the two months, as I mentioned, and we're going to analyze the prostate tissue effects the vitamin D receptor on paraffin tissues, RNA sequencing to assess differential expression, and then we're going to do a MALDI mass spectrometry tissue analysis, looking for particular changes in lipids and lichen patterns and how they correlate with histopathological features. That's just what I said. I'm not going to say it again. So this pilot study was to, as I mentioned, it, the two months interval from biopsy to prostatectomy is standard. We give you that much time to recover anyway. There were 27 subjects enrolled, there were 14 Caucasians and 10 African Americans. And prostate tissue samples were obtained at surgery and processed for RNA sequencing and analysis. This is just a list of the patients who were involved. Anybody with 3 plus 3 had high volume 3 plus 3, there were some 3 plus 4s, there were T3As and T3Bs present in this group. So the initial thing we did was we looked at the African American samples and we looked at the Caucasian samples. And when we compare them, just looking for genetic differences, if you use a false discovery rate of less than 0 0.1, we saw 3,106 genes which were differentially expressed. If we lower that requirement to a false discovery rate of less than 0 0.4, we saw over 8,000 genes that were significantly differently expressed. We did a gene ontology analysis and also a pathway analysis to, number one, look at the various genes affected and also how they affected the various pathways involved in prostate cancer. And the pathway analysis showed that the African Americans had a higher expression of genes associated with immune response and inflammation. And these are the heat map uh, patterns that we saw. On the left are the European Americans, if you like, on the right, the African Americans. Red means upregulated, blue means not active. And you can see, in terms of regulation of immune response, lymphocyte activation and T cell activation, all of them were significantly upregulated, as was dendritic cell mutation and maturation, complement system activation, crosstalk between the dendritic cells and natural killer cells, and NF kappa beta signaling. And I will get to that in a minute. So currently, these observations are consistent with the previous report, which revealed enhanced expression in prostate tissue samples from African-American men for biological pathways lead to autoimmune disease, allergies, and inflammatory diseases. 
The results support the existence of considerable biologic difference within the prostate between the two groups and suggest an overexpression of the genes linked to the inflammatory process may contribute to the increased severity and faster progression of prostate cancer in African American men. We also identify differentially expressed genes in the prostate tissue specimens from the African American group themselves, because as I said, five were supplemented and five weren't. So when we did a gene analysis of, these, of this group of patients, there were 124 genes which were significantly different between the two groups. If you went to an FDR of less than 0 0.4, or greater than 0 0.4, sorry, less than 0 0.4, 817 genes were significantly different between these groups. And these highlight the impact that even a short period of vitamin D3 supplementation can have in a group which is deficient. And this is, again, a showing you the two different groups of African Americans, five supplemented, five not supplemented. So, so far, if we looked at the African Americans versus the European Americans, we found 8,238 genes differentially expressed. Then if we looked at the men, the African Americans who were supplemented, we found 817 genes that were differentially expressed between the African Americans themselves. And then this revealed, furthermore, if you look at this, there were 346 genes which were actually present in the difference between the Europeans and the African Americans and there were 471 genes in the African Americans, which were the ones that were not affected, which are the ones that we've been looking at very carefully and continue to do so. The final part of this talk is there was a very interesting paper which came out of the University of, Co of Colorado. It was by Lambert and Scott Lucia. And they were looking at GDF15 in prostate cancer. And they thought that in prostate cancer they would see there were low levels of GDF15 in the prostate cancers, not much and normal levels in the normal tissue. They didn't see that. But what they did see was they noticed that there was a lot of inflammation in some of the cancers. And they also noted that those inflammatory cancers had very low levels of GDF15 and at high levels of NF-kappa-beta. So what they said was this could be the missing link for how vitamin D is exerting its effect in prostate cancer, meaning if you have high levels of GDF15, you won't get the expression of NF-kappa-beta and you won't develop the inflammatory cancers. So we went back and we looked at the GDF15 in the patients who were supplemented by vitamin D, particularly the African-American patients, and lo and behold, we found that GDF15 was significantly upregulated in this group and NF-kappa-beta was significantly downregulated. So, in summary, 14 of these subjects received vitamin D3 supplementation, 13 received placebo. We did the RNA analysis, as I mentioned. I've told you about the genes that were different. But these results support the existence of a fundamental biological difference within the prostate between African Americans and European American men and would suggest that overexpression of genes linked to the inflammatory process may contribute to the increased severity and faster progression of prostate cancer. We may actually, in NF-kappa Bay, have a druggable compound that we can affect. So the prostate appears to be, at the molecular level, a sentinel organ for health disparities. Thanks very much.